Welcome and thank you for joining us as we worship on this special day in the life of uh, the church, including the, the Lutheran Church, um, as we celebrate or commemorate rather the Reformation. Um, today's service, um, looking at what does Jesus mean that the truth shall set us free? What truth and how does it set us free? My name is Pastor Peter Gallieni and I'm the pastor of the Ringwood Knox Lutheran Parish and I thank you for joining us here today and I welcome you. Let us begin. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing our opening hymn, The Church's One Foundation. Christ, the Apostle Paul says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore let us confess our sins to God our Father, since we have been justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We confess to you, Almighty God, before the whole company of heaven and to each other, that we have sinned in thought, word and deed by our own fault. Have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Forgive us all our sins 
and bring us to eternal life. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you and on behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is our refuge and strength. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God is an ever-present help in trouble. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. The Lord Almighty is with us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have given all holy scriptures for our learning. Lead us to hear them, read, note, learn, and inwardly digest them. Encourage and support us by your holy word, <coughs> so that we may always hold on to the joyful hope of eternal life which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now hear our Bible readings for Reformation Day. Our first reading is written in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning at verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at, day, at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Our second reading is written in St. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Sanctify us in the truth, Lord. Your word is truth, alleluia. And the Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel according to St. John in chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Glory to you, O Lord. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of your word. Keep us faithful to your word, so that we may know the truth and the freedom it brings. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I'm going to mainly be using our Gospel, but also uh, referring to the um, other readings as well. Um, and those words that Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in this truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Like a lot of people, or maybe most people, in fact, probably all people, I don't like to admit when I've been wrong. I don't like it when my errors are pointed out by others. It's very uncomfortable. And when it happens, we can become very defensive. It's a human weakness. And it goes right back to the beginning of creation with Adam and Eve. You see, when they sinned, they hid from God. And then when God confronted them, they both pointed the figure, their finger away from themselves. They blamed others. Adam even blamed God, along with his wife Eve. The woman you gave me, she made me eat. Eve? When confronted in turn, said, don't look at me. It was the snake. He tricked me. Now, I'm not suggesting things would have been different, but I wonder what would have happened if Adam and Eve fell on their knees and sought God's mercy and admitted their error instead of hiding and denying it. It seems to be a natural defence to deny responsibility and look for ways to justify our actions. And it can manifest in several ways. We can deny the wrongdoing. It wasn't me, like Eve. We can compare ourselves to others. Well, at least I'm not as bad as that person over there. Remember the Pharisee and the tax collector? Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other people, especially that tax collector over there. We can point the finger to other people and blame them, like Adam did. In fact, children love that one, don't they? Well, he started it. No, I didn't. You did. Now, this is the principle that is at the heart of the Reformation. The Reformers had a term for this way we deal with our sin. In curvatus in se, that we are curved in on ourselves. We protect ourselves. And so when Luther was dealing with his own sinfulness, it drove him to despair. Because he looked for relief inside himself. He tried to balance his sin with good deeds, tried to prove to himself, not just to God, but to himself, that he was worthy of God's love and acceptance. But the more he looked inside himself, the more despair that he discovered. In fact, Luther began to despise Jesus as a tyrant. It was said that the only way to appease this vengeful Jesus as taught by the church was to seek the kind and beneficent intercession of his mother Mary. Like others in his church Luther went to the mother of God who unlike her vindictive son was full of tenderness and compassion. Mary became the sole refuge for this terrified monk until he discovered the glorious truth of salvation by grace through faith. The message of the book of Romans from where we take one of our readings. He discovered what St Paul discovered in his writing to the Romans. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. That the righteousness of God has been made known 
And the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Saved by grace through faith. Luther discovered that comfort for his sin was not found within ourselves, but by looking outside of ourselves to Jesus Christ. Now this is so counter-culture, because it is not inbred in us by birth and by society. We have original sin by which we are born with. And we have society teaching us a very different message. To many it would seem like a weakness to admit that you have a fault. Jesus had this discussion with the Pharisees. Because you see, they looked to themselves for justification before God. They said, well, we are Abraham's descendants. So what are you talking about? That we are slaves. We've never been slaves to anyone. Well, there's their first error. Had they forgotten their forefathers who were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? But that was not going to give them any peace. Instead, Jesus said, listen, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's our message today to us. Luther finally discovered the peace that came not by trying to meet an unobtainable standard before God. You see, God's standard is perfection, holiness. It's not by trying to justify ourselves before God as Adam and Eve tried to. It's not by trying to justify himself by comparing himself to others. In fact, he discovered what Paul said in Romans, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, including himself. It wouldn't be by his credential. I've given my life as a monk. As if somehow this might balance in favour like the Pharisees tried to. We are children of Abraham. But by discovering God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ and the truth that all are justified freely by grace through Jesus Christ. That is the truth that sets all of us free. All have sinned, but all are forgiven. So just as all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so too Jesus Christ has justified freely by his grace. And it was that truth that set Luther free, and it's the same truth that sets us free. This was the beginning of the Reformation, where the church was reformed, from a church that focused inward to indulgences and other penances to Christ alone. We live in a world where there is so many expectations placed on us, whether it's financially, socially, career, sporting achievements. There is so much expectation placed on us to succeed and it is causing great mental strain and stress, particularly on children to achieve these expectations that are placed on them by society and by parents. Especially at this time, with exams. And then soon it will be tertiary entrance scores to see if you're accepted. How 
how freeing it is that when it comes to God and our salvation, that there are no expectations placed on us when it comes to being accepted as his children. A new covenant has been written. Before God, there are no distinctions, as Paul said in Romans. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile or any other classification. All have been saved by Christ. All have been created in God's image, as we heard in last week's sermon. And all have been saved by grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is only we who make those expectations that cannot be met. Whether they're on ourselves or on other people. How truly freeing it is knowing that we are loved by God so much unconditionally. Sometimes that is hard to stand, understand when we look in the mirror. Remember what our confession saying that the law acts like a mirror as we look at it and we realise how far we have fallen from God. That we can't even love ourselves. And yet God, the creator of the universe, actually loves us. Warts and all. It was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. He loves us because he created us in order to love. Do you understand that? God created you to love. This is something we should never doubt. Because God is love. The Reformation was an historic event in the church. But it continues today. The church must keep on reforming because we constantly attempted to look away from the scriptures to other truth. <coughs> it began a new movement in the Protestant church. But more than that, it reinstated in the minds of the common person that God loved them unconditionally. That God would remember our sins no more. And neither should we. As St Paul says in Corinthians, love keeps no record of wrongs. There's only one person who remembers sin. <coughs> Pardon me. And that is Satan. He loves to use our guilt against us. He loves to press on us that there is nothing lovable in you. Why would God love you? But it is just as God said to Israel. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other nations. In fact, you are the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that God loves you. And that's the same as us. God doesn't love us because we're good. In fact, we are far from good. God loves us. That's why he chose us. The Lord loves you. And he has given his son for you. For one reason. So that you may live with him in heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And his truth truly sets you free. <coughs> May that peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to sing our offering hymn, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Heavenly Father, there is nothing that we could offer to you as a sacrifice for our sin. Yet in your great love you have offered up your own Son, so that through him we may be put right with you. Accept the gifts we offer here today as mere tokens of our gratitude for the great gift of salvation which you have given to us. Amen. We have been put right with God through faith in Christ Jesus. So let us come to the Father in the name of Jesus to pray for the church, the world and all those in need. Let us pray. Lord, as the church is in the constant process of checking and reforming itself against your holy word, guide us as we search for your will and direction in the age ahead of us. Give us wisdom in this task, a thirst for your truth and a love for your gospel. Send your Holy Spirit to guide all people who are searching for the truth and lead them to the source of all truth, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you that Christians of differing traditions and opinions are learning to sit down together and talk. We pray for the work of dialogue between churches and we thank you for those agreements already reached in places around the world where Christians are still taking up arms against each other. We ask for you to bring peace, patience, love and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your church is in a constant process of reformation. But we also thank you for the renewal and reformation you have brought to all your people through our baptism in Christ Jesus. Let each of us be reformed as we drown the old Adam every day and be renewed as we rise to new life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for all pastors <clears throat> and teachers of the word. Help them to remain faithful to the truth at all times. Let them preach the gospel boldly to people everywhere who are weighed down by guilt and sin so that they might be set free. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also ask for your blessing upon reformers in society, for all those who work to bring justice and peace into this troubled world. Guide governments and leaders everywhere and inspire them in your truth so that at all times and in all places your will may be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, we trust that by your Holy Spirit you will always lead your church forward in truth. Guide us and lead us so that by your renewing word we may give light and truth to the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us pray the prayer which our Lord has taught us. Lord, teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, dear friends, let us go in peace and the Lord will keep you safe. Thanks be to God. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favour and give you peace. Amen. Well, again, thank you uh, for joining us today. May God bless you uh, in the week ahead. And uh, may you know and feel the renewing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and how it brings so much freedom to us. We're going to sing our closing hymn, Lord of Creation.